No, no, no. It continues, same thing. Okay. No, keep going. Keep playing the video. Not Tyler. You. I'm just going to start. We'll go right to the video. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah, we got lots of people today. Is this it? Okay, I think we're live. There's been a little uh, video fun stuff going on here, but I think we're live. And I just want to say welcome to WildFit. My name is Eric Edmonds, and I'm going to be your host. And we are going to have so, so very much fun. The first thing I would like to ask you guys to do is in the chat, I want you to tell us where you're all coming from. I want to get a sense of where you guys are all coming from. And then I want to share with you a little bit about what this journey is going to be about. The first thing you really need to know is this is not a diet and it'll be not like any other kind of a diet type thing you've ever been on. So what does that mean? It means that we're not going to ask you to count calories. We're not going to ask you to buy special supplements and foods. We're not going to ask you to go to spin classes and try to burn your calories away. You know, there's the classic idea of the de definition of uh, insanity being doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. I think that's the perfect definition of the entire diet industry. So what you're going to find and what you've probably already found if you've watched the first video at this point is that we're going to do things very differently, like very, very differently. And so this week, this week where you probably arrived thinking that the first thing I was going to do is like take away a bunch of stuff from you, take away this and take away that and don't do this and restrict yourself here. You notice that we've gone a different way and the different ways for you to say, be you this week. Be you so that we can learn about ourselves, so that you can learn about your psychology, you can learn about your relationship with food, and you can really begin to understand the way you make food decisions. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this, you see, because when I did the very first Wild Fit class and I gave that first class the instruction, change nothing this week, just be yourself, just be live, just go for it. And what happened was I got three types of, of interactions or three types of results. The one was like, absolute relief, like absolute relief. Oh, thank God. I thought he was going to take away cookies and ice cream and you know, all that stuff. And now he didn't take it away. But the other reaction was dismay. Like there were people who were like openly disappointed that I didn't take away those things because they'd spent the last week binging up on them and it wasn't working. They, 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 now they wanted to stop and they were annoyed that I didn't take those things away. Now, now the next thing, the next thing, the third reaction was confusion, dismay. It was like, well, I don't understand. I came here to do this and I don't get that. And 
I would say that those three reactions all existed for you out there, except for some of you who are here doing Wild for the second time. You knew this was coming. So for those of you, this is your first time, I want you to check in with yourself. Which reaction did you have? Because this is the beginning in progress. to understand your food psychology. If you came in here like a little relieved, what were you relieved that I didn't take away? Because probably you have a bit of an emotional hang up about that thing. And that's going to be a big part of your discovery. If you were annoyed, what were you wishing I would take away? And then you have to ask yourself, why do you need me to take it away for you to stop eating it? That's fascinating. And so pay attention to that. This is the beginning of you unlocking your own food psychology. Now, for those of you who are doing this program again, and I've sent you into this week, I've said, eat what you want to eat, eat what you would normally eat. I want to be clear. This does not mean go all the way back to the person you were before you did Wild Fit the first time. You probably have established that there are a number of foods that are below the don't line for you. In other words, you don't really eat them. And so this is not an instruction to you that you should bring those things back. You should only bring back that which you are using willpower to fight. If you are wanting it, then you should have it in the course of this week. But if you are free of it already, there's no need to bring it back. And I hope that's really clear. Now, I want to talk a little bit about transformation and the way this process is going to work. There are some really important things to understand. The first thing is it works. In fact, in the chat, if any of you have been through WildFit before, share your honest opinion about that. Share your honest experience, maybe even some of your results, so that the people that are coming here for the first time can kind of get your inspiration. WildFit works. Now, here's how to make it work even better. I want to suggest to you that you watch the videos as they come out, on the day they come out. You might be a little like I was in school, and that is you let stuff pile up, pile up, and then you kind of cram your way through it. The reason that that's not the best way to do this program is that this program is built on something called behavioral change dynamics. And that means that every bit of content that you're receiving was carefully designed to be given to you at the time it was given to you on that day. And that the idea is, is that each of those things is stacking on the next thing. It's a very logical progression and it makes a lot of sense. So it's really important that you do the best you can, the best you can to watch the videos when they come out. Also, there are going to be live calls like this. Now, you have two different types of live calls. You have live calls like this with the whole group. And as you can see, there are many, many people involved in live calls. Oh, there you are. You exist. Oh, and I can even see the chat. Look at that. See, WildFit works. Gabriel says it totally works. Donna, don't send me private messages, Donna. Everyone in here can read them. So uh, <laughs> look at this, Gina, I let go of 80 pounds. My husband lost 120 pounds. We've never felt better. I mean, uh, you can keep going with that. But for those of you who are first timers, I'm hoping you're getting a little inspiration from that. Although you might be going, yeah, but why are they back? You might be asking that. And I want you to know that there's a few reasons. One is this, have you ever watched like a Disney movie with your kids, and then the kids want to watch it again and again. So occasionally you've had to watch it like more than once, but then you notice there were layers of jokes that you didn't get the first time. In fact, really well-made Disney and Pixar cartoons are built with two layers of humor. There's the kid humor, and then there's the subversive adult humor at the top. And sometimes you have to watch it the second time to get that. Whilst it can be a little bit like that. The other reason or the other issue is, is that people change when they go through this program. And that means that when they go through it the second time, they actually see things or experience things that they didn't the first time. And then the third thing to consider, and this is very important, and that is that, listen, the food industry is working very, very hard to win you back. As we win you your freedom, the food industry is going to be running you down and trying to win you back. And so sometimes what people find is that they've drifted a little bit and they need a little support coming back. And so that's why you'll see people coming back and doing the program again. So now, now, this is so important. It's not all going to be easy. And I want to say this really carefully because truthfully, what our clients mostly say, not everybody, but mostly say is this is the easiest thing they've ever done. And on top of that, it worked. In other words, they've done a whole lot of really hard things and most of them didn't work. Most of them didn't work. In fact, I'd love to know in the chat, what are some of the more difficult diet type things you've tried to do and did it or did it not work or how long did it work for? I'm curious, a little market research. But so many of our clients will say this is the easiest thing they've ever done. And that's because it's designed to be easy. But that doesn't mean the whole journey is easy. And I want to be clear about that. I want to be clear about some things you need to be aware of. The first thing is, 
And the first thing is this, that um, while this week and next week, you're focusing on your psychology and your foundations. Every single week, we will be asking you to make a variety of changes. And please don't ask me what those changes are in advance. And if you've done this program before, no spoiler alerts. The program is designed on the system of reveals. People know as much as they need to know as they're going through it. So please do not, if, if you see somebody posting in the Facebook group or in the chat here and you're, and you're, and you're, uh, and they're going, Hey, what happens next week? I know that there's something, there's something delightful about being in the know. You know, there's something delightful about like being in the know and you go, Ooh, I could tell you, don't let your ego do that to you. Let the people have the experience that they, that they want to have. I'm so distracted by the chat. Isn't it fascinating? It's so fascinating. So, all right, now let's talk about where some of the challenges might come in. I want you to know that um, there's going to come a point uh, sometime this week or maybe next week where you are going to want to uh, stop eating something that we haven't asked you to stop eating yet or we haven't asked you to take a break from. And you're going to be tempted. You're going to be like, I don't really feel... Like, I feel like I can use my willpower to, to avoid this. I could be good. I could be good right now. I could, I, could, I could not finish it or I could resist it. I don't want you to resist anything. I don't want you to resist. It's really important this week that as you approach your life, that you approach your life the way you normally would have, with your normal levels of eating what you normally would have, even if you know it to be quote unquote bad. It's really important because, as I said, in order to get different results, we're going to try different strategies. And we're going to do things here that are designed in a very literal sense to rewire your brain, to rewire your relationship with food. Here's something we can't really say in the marketing, but now that you're already here, I can say it. It is incredibly likely. In fact, I'd love confirmation in the chat from anybody who's done this before, but it is incredibly likely that there are foods in your life right now that have power over you. In other words, if they're available, you eat them. If somebody offers them, you eat them. They're there. You could be trying to be on a diet and still you give in. Those foods have some power over you. It's incredibly likely that you will simply stop desiring some of those things. What I'm saying here is that you will simply like not even want them. And this is such an important thing. I'm not saying it'll magically happen with every single thing, but it is part of the freedom process. You will pass something called the zero point. Now, the zero point, one way to think of the zero point is there's a bird on the ground and the bird wants to fly. So it starts flapping its wings and it has to put a lot of effort in. But once it gets to a certain height, it can just sail. And that's that moment when the craving is gone and the desire is gone. And I want you to know it's incredibly likely that some of the foods that currently have power over you will become undesirable. They'll become non-food for you. That's super exciting. That will work, that will happen if you follow the program, if you follow the steps and, and, and watch the videos and, and come to the live calls and go through the process. Now, I also want you to know that when you get out to about you know, week three or four or so, there's a chance that you may have actually added a little bit of weight. And if you've come here to lose weight, that might be frustrating for you. In fact, you could even get a little angry about that. Uh, you might. And I just want you to know in advance that that might happen because, again, I want you to hear me. In order to get different results, you have to try a different strategy. There are things that we are doing in these early weeks that are fundamental to creating lasting change for you, that are fundamental to making sure that you never have to go on a diet ever again, ever. And so if it happens that you possibly put on a little bit of weight in these first couple of weeks, please don't worry about it. It's part of the process. It's meant to be. In fact, it simply means you're doing things right. It's everything's going to be okay. Now, when you get out to say weeks six and seven and eight, here are some things that might happen. They're not necessarily going to happen. They happen to maybe 10 or 15% of people, but these things might happen. It is possible that you might develop a bit of a skin rash. It's possible that you might develop a little bit of a cold or fluy type symptoms. It's possible that your sleep gets a little interrupted. You might have some leg cramps. You might have some of these little, little speed bumps, little onboarding experiences. I want you to know that those are signs that your body is doing what it needs to do. So when they happen, I think you should just smile about it. It might be unpleasant. You're like, oh, that's itchy. Oh, cool. <laughs> oh, I've got it. I want you to see it as a, as, a, as a signpost on the road to success, not as a speed bump. So that's why I'm letting you know about it now. I also want you to know something else. You will see 
comments from people that are talking about like reversing diabetes or uh, getting off their blood pressure medication or reversing autoimmune disease and all that kind of stuff. And that's all very exciting, but we are not here to offer medical advice of any kind. So every now and again, a question will come up about medical stuff. And I will disclaim that I'm not here to offer medical advice. I do have to offer a little bit of medical advice right here though. And that is this. If you are currently on medication for what you might consider to be a quote lifestyle disease, and I, I put that in air quotes as much as I hate air quotes, it, it's the only way to say that. And I'll explain why afterward. But if you are dealing with a, a lifestyle disease and you are on medication for that disease or that situation, uh, it's very important that you uh, monitor yourself and possibly go and speak to your doctor around about week six and seven. So let me give you some examples. If you are on blood pressure medication, that medication is designed to lower your blood pressure, it's very important that you keep an eye on your blood pressure and keep a dialogue with your doctor because it is very likely that as a result of some of the changes that you're going to make, that your blood pressure will naturally go lower. And so if you're now taking blood pressure suppressant medication and your blood pressure goes down, then you get this thing called the dizziness or the, even the passing out. So you want to make sure that you're keeping an eye on your blood pressure and that you're talking to your doctor about that because it's very likely that you'll be told to cut down, reduce, or maybe even come off that medication at some point. Same thing here. If you're on, uh, if you're using insulin, you already know how to manage your blood, your, 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 your measure your blood sugar and manage your insulin. You will very likely have to change your insulin use and use a lot less and maybe even stop needing to use it. If you're on other diabetic medication, same thing. Keep a real close eye on your blood sugar and keep a good dialogue with your doctor. I could keep going with other things. If you're on thyroid support medication, same thing. Please keep like I would suggest it's a really good idea if you're on these types of medications to right now book time with your doctor in about week seven or so, so that you can go and see if your medication needs to be altered. One more thing, do not alter your medication without medical advice. The only exception to this might be diabetic medication that you've already been self-regulating, but in every other case, don't. And I'm going to give you a shocking example as to why. We've had this conversation with people quite often at WildFit. They get to about week seven, eight, nine, and they're like, um, Eric, or they're talking to their coach and like, Eric, you know, I've got, I've got a, something weird is going on. I go, what is it? I, 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 life looks brighter. There's something, I feel funny. Oh, you might be experiencing happiness. It's, it's possible. It's possible that you're engaged with a little bit of happiness and maybe it's been a little while. Now, if you are on any kind of antidepressant and you start feeling very good, it is important that you do not simply stop taking your antidepressants. It's important that you talk to your doctor about that. The side effect of shock dropping antidepressants in many cases is very serious depression and even suicidal tendencies. So I, I, and I'm just using that one example. I'm wanting you to know that it's totally possible that you will need to adjust some of your medications, but I don't want you to do that on your own. I want you to do it with a medical professional. Sounds fair? Fair for you guys? All right. Now, earlier, I went on a sidetrack because I said there are two types of calls that you have. The first call is are these large calls, these calls with, I don't even know how many people are on. We've got about 600 people on with us right now. And I know many people are also watching these calls on the, on the recording. So if you, I want to stress to you, it's always better if you're on these calls. But if something gets in the way, we also make the recordings available for you. The other type of call you have, if you've come in with a coach, is that you have private private coaching calls with your coach. If you do not have that and want that, then you can reach out to our help desk or you can go to our website to the find a coach page and you can find yourself a coach. And what that means is that you'll get a little bit more concierge service, a little bit more personal service. As you can imagine, it is not likely that I will get to talk to all 600 people today. I, I, it's a guess I've got. I, I think it's a reasonable guess. Whereas if you're working with one of our certified wildfit coaches from around the world, you will get a lot more personal attention. Many of you came in with a coach. That's excellent. So um, then what you're going to have is private calls with your coach as well as these larger calls. So one last thing that I want to share with you about this journey. And this is a metaphor that I developed a long time ago to kind of guide you through this process because freedom is something that is a... Um, it's, a, it's a hard one and fought for commodity. It is not easy. Freedom is not easy. It's, it, it needs to be battled for sometimes. And freedom from the food industry is no exception to this rule. The food industry has worked very, very hard to capture you. Like very hard. 
Not only have they pumped billions of dollars into manipulative and hypnotic advertising campaigns using the most advanced psychological techniques that you could possibly imagine to get you to want their food over some other food, that not only have they done that, but they've also manipulated food science in the most incredible ways. One day you're reading an article that'll tell you that eggs cause diabetes. They don't. And the other one you'll read that says eggs fight diabetes. Arguably, maybe they can as part of the right lifestyle. But the point is, is that how is it, and this is a true story, how is it that one publication, the same publication, one of the most widespread publications on earth could run both of those stories? How is that possible? One says eggs are causing diabetes. The other says, how is that possible? Well, let me just give you one example so you can ignore all the food science you're going to read for the next three months. Don't even bother reading it. And I'll give you this explanation. The article that said that eggs cause diabetes. It referred to a study. And so I decided that instead of just reading this media manipulated article, what I would do is actually go read the actual study. I know it's a novel approach. It's a, I've, I've discovered that people get their education like this. Some people read the headline. Now they're educated. Some people read the actual article. Now they're a little more educated. I just can't help it. I go and read the study. So here's what I found out in the study. First of all, the study made no reference to diabetes at all. That was a leap of imagination and creative license by the person who wrote the article. What this study indicated was with it, some people eating eggs in a certain way caused a slight increase in blood sugar. The publication, you know, I, I, I'm not here to out any particular publication. It's just like a daily newspaper, you know, in England, that, you know, that comes by mail. I don't know what newspaper it is, but, but the point is, is that somebody at that newspaper for a reason made the leap from a slight increase in blood sugar to diabetes. There's a relationship, but that's not what the study said. Then I went deeper into the study and I found something else that the study, the study, it said that it only happened to women. It was only the women that had this increase in blood sugar, which is odd. I mean, look, there are some differences between men and women. I've seen them, you know, there, there are some differences. But that's not one of them that I can tell. Like, I don't understand this. So I decided to read even deeper into the study. You know what? The, one of the best places in any study you read is this area called disclosures. Disclosures. It's a fascinating part of the study. Here's where you find out who paid for the study. Yeah, like Nestle. Here, here's, who, here, here's who you find out, um, um, you know, who the doctors were and any conflicts that they potentially had. That's where you find that kind of stuff out. Here's what I found in the disclosures. Note. The women in this study largely did not enjoy the consumption of eggs in fried or boiled form and therefore consumed their eggs in the form of baked goods like muffins, croissants, donuts, and pancakes. I wonder if that would raise your blood sugar. I wonder. I'm telling you this right now because I want you to understand that over the next three months, you will probably start to become really curious about food and really curious about nutrition. And that might cause you to go and consult with the best nutritionist in the world, Dr. Google. But I want you to know that over the next three months, what I'm gonna ask you to do is just keep the faith here just for the three months. Because the food science that you're reading out there is almost entirely bought and paid for. And I'll show you how that works. I want you to imagine that we're at a university and we have two potential studies that we might wanna look at. One is a study about the relative stress that cows have when they take their calves away, just the relative stress that cows have when they take, that's an interesting question, don't you think? I mean, we've seen cases, and there was a case in England where a cow had her calf taken away and the calf was taken to another farm and the cow broke out of her pen and found the other farm. Like if you're a mother, I want you to imagine you're in a mall, your child is taken to some mall that you don't know and you break out of the first mall and manage to find the child in the other mall and the cow did this. We don't even know how to, is this worth study? I think that's worth studying. So that's one study we could do. But now the other study we could do is on the relative impact on exogenous hormones on milk production from the cows. But we have a limited amount of money for these studies. So which study do we do? We do the second study because it's profitable because money could be made from it. No money can be made from the first study. But the second study, if we figure that out, if we figure which hormones cause cows to produce even more milk, oh, that's profitable. So uh, over the next three months, I'm gonna ask you to ignore that stuff. I'm gonna ask you to ignore the, the diet gurus and the fad diets and the fake food research and all that kind of stuff. Because, and I'm gonna offer you one principle by which you can measure it all. And here is the principle. Any food rule, any food fad, 
any science that you ever read about that violates evolutionary biology must immediately be considered suspect. So as an example, if somebody comes along and they show you this berry and they go, this berry is a superfood. This berry is such a superfood, but that berry, you know, comes from say South America where the very first time that humans ever saw that food was like in the last 15,000 years. And the very first time any Europeans ever saw that food was about 400 years ago. That means that humans survived, say, 7 million years of evolution without that food, which means it's probably not necessary. And it doesn't mean it's bad for you, but it does mean that it's not necessary and that the marketing calling it a superfood is a lie. So I want us to start with that idea. Keep the faith here. Keep on track here. And, and if you do want to question stuff that you see out there, bring it. And certainly during our Q&A sessions, I'm up to talk about it. I'm just going to, there's a little example, a little story. And it says that the man with two watches never really knows what time it is. And so what I want you to do is let WildFit be your food watch for the next three months. And then after that, you'll be really well educated and you'll be able to go out there and make a bunch of discerning observations of your own. Now, the journey. First, let's neutralize thirst. The journey. As I said, freedom has to be fought for. And sometimes you actually, in a sense, have to give up a little bit of freedom to get the freedom. It's tough. And so the metaphor that I want you to think about as you go through this journey is like this. I want you to imagine that we're all in a POW camp together. And frankly, if you think about it, a POW camp is a whole lot safer than being in the trenches. So we feel a little bit safe. And, you know, now we're in this POW camp, they feed us. I mean, they control what we eat, but they feed us and we have a roof over our head and we're in the walls and there's a relative level of safety inside the POW camp. But what are they feeding us inside this camp? Processed food, refined sugar, garbage, and we're getting sick. We're developing diabetes, we're putting on weight. Maybe some of us are developing heart disease and cancer. We've got autoimmune diseases. We've got pain and inflammation in our, in our joints. Maybe we've got some allergies. This is starting to happen inside the POW camp. Are you with me? You got me? So now, Eric comes along and says, it's time for us to escape. I have a plan. We're going to escape the camp. I have noticed that the, that the setup of the bunk beds, if we lift this bed out, we can get down to the ground. And what we can do is we can start tunneling down we can start tunneling down into the ground. And what we're gonna do is everybody, we take the soil, put it in your pockets. And in the day when we're allowed to walk in the yard, you just drop the soil out there and we're gonna start tunneling down, down, down. And, and as we dig down, as we dig down, how excited are we gonna be? Pretty excited? Like we're gonna be pretty excited. We're getting down, progress. We're going down, we're getting out of this crap hole. We're going down, down, down. And down is very exciting. You know, one of the reasons that down is exciting. And by the way, down is the next two weeks of wild fit. We're going to dig down. We're going to dig down. And why down is very exciting is because there's nothing above you. So it's, it's, it's very freeing because you feel like you're making progress, but you also don't feel totally constrained. The thing is though, if we're going to try and get out of the camp by only going down, that's not going to work. Like we're, we're, we got, we're going to have to go sideways. We're going to have to eventually have to go sideways. So now we, we switch over and we start digging sideways. And now we're digging sideways and we're digging sideways and we're going through the tunnel. But what might we feel? in the tunnel. A little claustrophobia. We might feel a little constrained. It's dusty in there. It's hot. It's sweaty. And there's soil above us that could come crushing down at any second. It feels very constraining. I'm now talking about potentially weeks five, and six, and seven. And you start to feel like you have less freedom than you had in the camp. Sometimes freedom has to be fought for. So when you're starting to feel like that, if you do feel like that, you might be tempted to go back down the tunnel and go back to the POW camp. And all I'm going to suggest to you is that if you've got the tenacity and you've got the strength and you've got the team, which you do, look at the team you guys have, over 600 people from all over the world. And by the way, I want to show you guys something. This is fascinating. Uh, right now in the chat, in the chat, here's what I want to know. 
How many of you are totally, and you guys can raise your hands in here, how many of you are totally prepared to help if somebody raised their hand and says, I'm really struggling right now, I'm in the tight part of the tunnel and need a little help to get through? Who's totally willing to help? Let me see it. There it is. Me, 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 absolutely, 100%. Yes, 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 me, me, I will, absolutely, totally, 100%, 100, 100, 100, yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, excellent. Now watch this. How many of you, okay, stop answering for a second. We're in the next question. Here we go. How many of you, are slightly reluctant to ask for help. Slightly reluctant to ask for help. I'm just curious. Oh, look, it's still me, me, me. Hi, hi, hi. Yes, yes, yes. 100%, 100%, me, me, me. You're all hypocrites. Every one of you. I'm totally willing to help, but I won't ask for it. I won't ask for it. What is going on? Now, let me just show you something. Why are you willing to help? Because you like it. Yes, you're willing to help because you enjoy giving. You enjoy the generosity of it. You get something back from it. Why are you not willing to ask for help? Because you went to a school that taught you that collaboration is called cheating. You were conditioned to doing everything by yourself. But the real truth is, I want you to think about this. If you've got one person who loves to help and loves to give, and you've got somebody who needs help but is afraid to ask, this person is robbing that person of the chance. So if you don't ask for help, you are selfish. How selfish is that? So what that means is, is that as you're digging through the tunnel and you have these moments where you're struggling or something doesn't go quite right, where you give into some temptation in a given moment, and you feel like you might want to go back to the POW camp. Then what you do is you raise your hand, maybe both of them, and you say, I need some help. And then the people will jump in and they will be there for you. You've got, you've got people that are going through this for the first time. They want to help. You've got people that have gone through this two, three more times. They want to help. And you've got wild fit coaches all over the place and they want to help. And if you came here with a wild fit coach, you can get the personal help you need. So I want you to get that as you're tunneling through, they're going to feel, they're going to be moments that feel constrained. There might be moments like that where you just feel a little claustrophobic that the tunnel's a bit small. You got to keep going. Because while the tunnel is less free than the POW camp, there's going to come this moment where you're, you're tunneling out and you smell something. It's fresh air. There's air coming through. And, and then a little light breaks through. That's the light at the end of the tunnel. It starts to break through. It's not there yet. It's not there yet, but you're feeling it. And then, and then you break through and you break through. And all of a sudden, you stick your head up and you're not in the POW camp. You're free. You're absolutely free. And how this will feel for you, one of my favorite stories about this is that I was having a branding conversation with a good friend of mine. He's one of the founders of Zumba, Jeffrey. And he says, he says Eric, every great brand uh, owns like an emotion. You know, what's the emotion of Wildfit? And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, well, look, Harley Davidson, they like own rebellion. And Coca-Cola somehow allegedly owns happiness. And these brands kind of tie themselves to emotional state. He said, what's the, what's the frequency of wild fit? And I said, that's easy. It's freedom. And he goes, oh, that's a pretty big thing to own. Like, that's a billion dollar thing to own. That's, that's a tough frequency to own. And I, well, that's what we are. That's, that's, that's what we are. And he goes, well, we'll have to think about that. That might be, I don't know. I don't know. The next morning, we're in a five-star resort in Jamaica. And uh, we had breakfast. And this guy walks out of the... He walks out of the buffet line with a plate of food and he recognizes me. And this happens to me quite a lot in airports and stuff. One of the things that I find really odd about this is that when people recognize me, they feel very, it seems very important to them for them to remind me who I am. Like, you're Eric Edmonds. And I'm like, uh, thank you. Oh, I temporarily let that one go. But he comes up to me. He goes, you're Eric Edmonds. I go, yes, thank you. And he goes, I want to thank you. And I said, you're welcome. But what for? And I'm not kidding you. He goes, for my freedom. And Jeffrey and I are like, well, actually, the truth is, I was almost certain Jeffrey put him up to this. I thought Jeffrey set it up, you know, the guy, whatever, because we just had this talk. Now, I look over at Jeffrey. You remember the genie the in the original Aladdin and his the jaw is like, that's what Jeffrey looked like. But, but Jeffrey's super smart, right? A word like freedom has a lot of meanings. And so Jeffrey immediately says to the guy, what does freedom mean to you? What do you mean by freedom? Because it's different for everybody, right? What does it mean? And the guy goes, it's really simple. I just walked through the whole buffet line. And for the first time in my life, I've been in a resort like this that didn't have donuts and pancakes and waffles and muffins and stuff. I was blown away. So I turn around 
because I just couldn't believe it. I turn around and I look back into the buffet and there they were. There was the waffle sand, there was the pancakes, there was the muffins, the croissants, it was all there. But I didn't see it. That's freedom. And that's that feeling of sticking your head up out. You're out of the POW camp. But listen, this is important to know. When you stand up and you're standing on the grass free, are you actually free? You are, but they're going to keep coming. They're going to send the dogs. They're going to send the guards. They're going to try and get you back. And how are they going to do that? They're going to use manipulative advertising. They're going, to, they're going to sponsor food science to confuse you. How many of you have ever read how bad bread is for you? Anybody read how bad it is? Anybody read how good it is? <laughs> how about this? Wine, incredibly bad for you. Yes, wine, incredibly good for you. They're, they're doing that because they're intentionally attempting to create cognitive dissonance. They want to confuse you because if they can confuse you, you will give in to your basic needs and you'll eat sugar. That's what they're trying to do. And then, by the way, they will sneak sugar. They'll trap you. They'll set little POW camp traps. They'll leave out food for you. You'll be running, trying to get away, and they'll leave out food. And they'll be some food and be like, oh, this is perfectly good looking food. It says organic. It says natural. Must be good. You'll pick it up. And then you'll look at the label and you'll see that there are four different types of sugar on the label. You know why there's four different types of sugar on the label? Because that way they can move sugar down the label. If they only put one type of sugar in, it would be the number one ingredient in many foods or number two. But by naming four different types of sugar, they can scatter it way down. Oh, it's not much. It's the fifth and eighth. Yeah, but it's, it's the fifth, eighth, twelfth, and fifteenth ingredient. And then, and then they put it there because guess what's going to happen? You eat it and then you slow down a little. And then your cravings come back a little. And then they can try and drag you back to the camp. And so what this whole 13 weeks about, first is tunneling down so that we've got the distance from the camp and getting away from them. Then it's tunneling across to get out. And it might feel a little restrictive at times during that phase. It might feel a little claustrophobic. This might be when you feel some, some, some digestive issues. You might feel the, the, the rashes, a little bit of cold flu type symptoms. Only 10 or 15% of people, but I just want you to know that could happen. But then you'll breathe the fresh air and you'll have the freedom. And then in week 13, we're going to, you know, like if you imagine, I remember the old World War II movies. As soon as you got out of the camp, you met with one of the, you know, you met with one of the guys that was helping the escapees and they gave you your new passport and they give you new papers and they taught you a few, you know, phrases in German so you could get out of the country and all that kind of stuff. And, 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 and so what was, what's going to happen in week 13 is we're going to do the same thing. In week 13, we're going to go through the process of, in a sense, giving you your new passport and giving you the phrases and, and anchoring on all the stuff we've learned for the 12 weeks so that you can stay free after your escape. Does that sound good? All right. So with all that in mind, what we're going to do now is um, talk a little bit more about process here. When we have these live calls, um, and, and Christine, I just might not have the schedule. There's three this week and again next week. And then there are Mondays, one, once a week. Then they're once a week. And then, and, and again, there's, I think, multiple calls in week 13. And then sometimes we'll see, sometimes there's a reunion call about a month later. If, if there's enough excitement about a reunion call, we might do that. And then you've got your, also, you've got your own call schedule with your coach. So if you've come in with a coach, then you have your own call schedule with your coach. And I highly recommend that you do both sets of calls. But the truth of the matter is the call that's the most important one for you to do if you came with a coach is the call with your coach, because that's where you're going to get the more intimate coaching and the more intimate conversation. Um, what if my coach calls at 1 a.m.? Well, Dr. KJ, I'd say get up at 1 a.m., like go for it. I think that's a fabulous time. If the calls are off your schedule, they are recorded um, and we will make sure that you get those as well. So when we do these, uh, matter of fact, I'll take that question, Mary, but when we do these uh, uh, calls, what will happen is, is that people will be able to raise their electronic hands and we'll take their questions. And that's how the live calls will always be. So we'll do that again today, starting in a moment. Before I go to hand raising, I'm going to answer Mary and Jackie's question right now. Uh, they both asked the same thing. Is it okay if you're a vegetarian? Absolutely. And, and I, I will tell you, my personal belief is that it is not optimal and even the Vegetarian Society of the United States on their website disclaims that should you choose to be vegetarian, that there is certain supplementation that you should undertake because it will cause some shortages of certain things. We will address that 
later on in the program. It won't matter at least until about week five or six before we need to talk about that again. When we talk about increasing protein, and we are going to talk about pro, uh, prioritizing protein, if you're vegetarian, you can prioritize your protein through vegetarian sources. So yes, in fact, I was really surprised because I'm pretty vocal about my opinion that vegetarian may, it might not be optimal. I was very surprised to find that out on Facebook, like there, I even found one Facebook group, it's called Wild Fit for Vegans. And there's like over a thousand people in that group. We have thousands of vegetarian clients around the world. The one thing I'm going to ask you to consider as a vegetarian or a vegan is leave your ideology out. Like, and this is a really important thing. If you become ideological about something, about anything, then you will begin to sacrifice things for that ideology. And that's really careful. That's really important about health. So don't do things for ideological reasons, do them for good reasons. And so what that means is that if you're not um, super ideological, then as you come to the space where you're asking questions about protein and amino acids and that kind of stuff, I'm asking that some of you might consider being a little bit more flexitarian and experimental as you go through this. And we'll talk more about that when we get into week six or seven. But being a vegetarian or vegan, we have many, many vegetarian and vegan clients all over the world, you're, you're in the right place. Okay, so yeah, flexitarian, you've got it, Deanna. <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, how do you find a coach in the UK, Stephanie? Um, you can go, well, if there's any that are on the call, you can contact Stephanie directly. You can also go to getwildfit.com and there's a find a coach page and you can uh, find a coach there by their geographic location. So you can find a UK coach that way. If you struggle to find one, you could write to the help desk, support at getwildfit.com and they can get you hooked up. Um, are we allowed to exercise? I, I'm going to go to hand. Guys, you can start raising your electronic hand. And just before you start serving them up, I'll take some out of the chat. Uh, Rena, are we allowed to exercise during these three months? I just started dance lessons and it's all paid for already. Rena, we don't use in Wild Fit words like allowed or approved because we are about freedom. So there's not there's nothing allowed or approved about anything. You can do whatever you want. This entire thing is about freedom. We will make recommendations. We will re make recommendations and suggestions. And here's my suggestion about exercise. And this is a very important thing. Exercise is absolutely voluntary at this stage of your life going through this program. You do not have to do it. What I will want you to do is what we would call intentional movement. That is to say, you know, use your phone to count how many steps you're taking and try to get your seven or eight or 10,000 steps in a day. But do that by like, for example, do that by um, uh, like, Avoiding rockstar parking. I, I, you know, like rockstar parking, leave that for the moms that have, and dads that are traveling with their kids. Leave those spots for those people. You should park at the back of the parking lot and get your steps walking in. But do you need to go to a spin class? Do you need, no, you don't need to do any of that kind of stuff. If you want to exercise, let me offer this warning and disclaimer. Exercise, particularly, this is a little more true for women than it is for men. And it's a little more true if weight loss is a goal for you. Exercise can be counterintuitive or counterproductive relative to weight loss. It's a weird thing. Exercise is very good for long-term weight and long-term metabolism, but not so good in the short term. What happens is that if you do really intensive exercise, you raise stress chemicals in your body. And what that does is it causes your body to generate sugar cravings. It causes your body to retain fat. And it can even, because your body now doesn't want to burn the fat, it can even cause you to start breaking down protein or breaking down muscle. So it can be a problem, but there's an exception to this. And the exception is about your focus. So if exercise is fun and you're not stressing about it, then that's different. But if you are stressing about it at all, like if you're like, oh, I got to go to the gym and get your shoes and you have any of that in you, then you're making it stressful. But if you are, for example, you said you're going to dance classes. If you're going to dance classes, if you're going to a Zumba class, that's not stressful. That is all day fun. And so if you're doing that type of thing, everything is fine. Let's go live and connect with some people here. All right, who's up? Hello, Gemma. Hi. Hello. Lovely to meet you. I uh, actually have three questions and they seem to be inter interconnected. Um, I've been working, I managed to let go of 25 pounds last year, but I'm in menopause. So my hormones have been difficult to balance. I've been using um, different herbal stuff and making drinks for that. Um, and then I've discovered that because I have emotional trauma to release, terrible past, rape, beat and tortured, that kind of stuff. And it seems to be trapped in my fat and then releasing heavy metals. Um, so the combination gets 
pretty wild sometimes. Can you speak to that or is this going to like really put me in a bad place emotionally? I, first of all, I, um, I'm, I'm really sorry that you had to have those experiences. And, and I'm, I'm also really sorry that they have um, impacted your relationship with food and therefore your life experience and your health and so on. It's, it's tough. Uh, what I want to suggest is that um, one of the things that we're going to address here in WildFit is about uh, seasonality, and um, as you know. And so we're going to go through an adjustment of understanding seasons, not your local season that you live in, not, not the winter of Minnetonka or the spring of whatever. It's, it's, it's the metabolic modes that your body goes through. And so one of the very best metabolic modes um, for exactly the kind of thing you're describing is what we call spring. And you're going to get to experience that again. And it, spring is a really great time to do that. One of the challenges is you're absolutely right. As people start to lose weight, especially when there's trauma and, and toxicity, like for example, heavy metal and that kind of stuff, it can create in a, in a sense um, like what, what people call like a cleansing reaction. But what's worse is that if somebody's going through that and they're having blood sugar swings from heavy, car uh, heavy carbohydrate foods at that time, it can make it even more difficult. So as we go through these seasons, I think you're going to find that mood stabilization will help you to get through that stuff really well when we're in the season of spring. Um, the other thing is, I really recommend that you, um, like uh, one of our wild fit coaches, Nilima, uh, um, she is a gynecologist and works really closely on, on hormone medicine and that kind of stuff. And you might want to, if you're coming with a wild fit coach, you might want to talk to your wild fit coach about, you know, seeing if, if you can have a consultation with Nilima. I also recommend looking up and you guys can all look up Dr. Jay Wrigley. Dr. Jay Wrigley, um, if somebody could put his uh, uh, um, URL in the chat, that'd be great. Jay is a truly fabulous guy. I tracked him down because there, I had so many of our clients coming to us exactly, you know, women in an age category with a little weight that they want to live, lose with hormonal changes going on in their life. This is, this is a serious thing. And Jay's medical practice has largely been focused on exactly that area. Um, so he's really supported us in helping uh, make sure that WildFit is set up really well to help with that. And of course, if you ever want private consultation, you can reach out to Dr. Nilima or Dr. Jay. Thank you. Cool. Am I? Nancy. Nancy, you're making me dizzy. You're making me dizzy. Nancy. Hello, Nancy. Nancy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm so excited to be here. I am going through Wild Fit for the second time. I did it in 2001. Um, I was able to release a significant amount of late, a weight. Um, I know it's not a medical thing, but I was actually able to get off my cholesterol medicine. So that statin elimination was huge for me. Um, my struggle was living Wild Fit sustainability. I love the example that you used about the Disney movie because I know that you find new things. Is there something specific you want to tell us second timers or third timers around to really watch out for or really focus on as we're, you know, as we're trying to develop the tools to sustain the lifestyle um, after the 90 days? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when you go through something the second time, you, ha you run the risk of having a, a, your glass be full. Like, oh, I know this part. I don't need to watch this video. Uh, I don't really need to go to the call this week because I kind of know what's going on. Um, as a second timer or a third timer, you should be even more diligent about making sure you go through the videos and even more diligent about making sure that you're on the calls. And the reason being is that you have an understanding. Look, what people go through over this 90 days, it's, I mean, I think we've done a great job of, of constructing it so it's bite-sized, and but it's still ultimately a lot of information from a fire hose. So the odds of you getting everything the first time you go through it, uh, you, there's stuff you're going to miss. There's stuff you're going to pick up when you do it the second time. So it makes it very important that you go through that process. The other thing I want to remind you, and this is a very important thing, is that when you come out the other side, you know, at the end of 90 days, you are at your best, right? You're totally at your best. And it's totally possible that as a result of a little social pressure or the food industry, you know, manipulation or just old emotional patterns coming up that you slide off your best a little bit. Now, I want you to hear me about this. This is very important. What happens for a lot of people if they slide off their best a little bit is that they start to judge themselves. Does this sound familiar at all by chance? 
Absolutely. Uh, maybe. I, it's just a guess I was making. But <laughs> and what happens is they come off their best a little and then they start to judge themselves. And the problem is that judgment usually comes with these emotions, regret, shame, and guilt. The problem is, is that regret, shame, and guilt are food triggers. So now it begins this slippery slide kind of thing. And so one of the things that we have to do is look at it in an entirely different way. So let me ask you, compared to your life before, because, you know, like before you released all this weight, compared to your life previously, how good are things now compared to the way they were before? Oh, much, much better. Um, years removed from some trauma like everyone else. Um, my husband passed away. Things were not going well. I have a teenage son who's actually so much more mature now. Um, I'm in a much better place, much better living living space, better location, more access to all the stuff I need, the entertainment, the um, exercise, I'm just everything is just um, a world better. And I feel better about myself too. So moving into a different space is so important. There you go. And see what that that's the way to look at this is that if you come into say you're in week 13, you get to week 14, 15, 16, you get to three months later, four months later, and you've come off your best and you're not totally on track the way you wanted to be, then the first thing to do is to recognize that you are still wildly successful. You know, I remember reading the story about this guy. He was worth like eight billion dollars. And then he there was some tragic investment that his investment company made and he lost like six billion and he was down to two billion. And his answer to that was to walk out the balcony of his high rise apartment and jump because he felt yeah. like a failure. He still he was down to two billion. I mean, I can't what. But so that's what happens. Sometimes people come off their best and then they start beating themselves off about the little bit that they're off their best instead of celebrating how much they're still way better than it was before. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is ask for help. Ask for help from other wild fitters around the world. Go to wild fit meetups and, or, and ask for help from a professional. Get a wild fit coach to support you through that journey and, and keep yourself on track. As much as wild fit really is almost magical in its capacity for lifestyle revision, the truth of the matter is, is that we all need a little help from time to time. And so you got to be willing to ask for it. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Next we have Aldona. Hey, Jim. Good to see you. Hi. Hello. Am I on? Uh, uh, about the conversation with Nancy, this reminded me when before doing Wild Fit the first time, I was binging on pretzels and chocolate. And now I still binge, but it's on Clementines. So <laughs> that's a quality binge upgrade. <laughs> exactly. I sometimes binge. Okay, so my question is, I've been through Wild Fit the first time as a vegan and it worked perfectly fine. Now I'm looking to lo to uh, check this out a little bit more. I heard you saying in the frequently asked questions for week one, which is something I missed before, you're referencing some additional videos that you have on meat eating on YouTube. I wasn't able to find them. Could you please have someone post a link or something they will actually be released to you at the right stage of the program. So there's a there there are a number of bonus videos. There's a there's a video on um, uh, there's a video that explores dairy products. There's a video that explores grain. There's a video that explores general addiction. There are some bonus videos, and they will be unlocked as you get to those stages. So there's there is there is that video there there is that video one of the bonus videos. Yeah yeah there's that that video is in there. It'll be unlocked for you probably I would guess in about week six. Uh, okay I've I know those because. Yeah, they were there the first time, first time around. I thought there's something additional that you have on this topic. Um, it may have been that it was added since you were there, or it may be that as you came in as a vegan, it wasn't interesting to you. Uh, I don't know, but it, it, it is there. And if you can't find it, definitely reach out to the help desk. We'll find it for you. Oh, no, I know those ones. Okay, I thought there was something additional that you mentioned. Thank you. You're welcome. You've got Luke up next. Hello, Luke. Hi there. How are you doing, Eric? Good. How are you? Good. Uh, a quick question for you regarding my family. I got a daughter that's 16. Um, she has Crohn's and uh, I like to get her involved. And I have a son who's nine, who's developing some bad food habits. Um, and yeah, just wondering your thoughts on integrating with uh, younger, younger family. 
Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, one of my um, funnest little wild fit experiences is some years ago, we uh, took a film crew and we traveled all over Vancouver Island. And we were driving up Vancouver Island, stopping in at different wild fit people's houses. And, you know, just like, I won't say we completely surprised them because, you know, we had to warn them we were coming, but it was, it was still a bit of a surprise. And one of the houses we went to, it was really cool. The, the, uh, the mom, Amber, uh, I knew that she'd done wild fit and had an incredible turnaround in her own health and stuff. And I knew that her 16 year old son had also, I think, lost about 25 pounds or so, which at 16 is, that's a big deal. That's a really big deal. So we went there and we're sitting down outside. They have this sort of one of those picnic table swing type things. And we're having a chat and, uh, and, 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 you know, the documentary guys are filming all this. And, and then all of a sudden this younger boy comes running out, a younger boy comes running out and, and they're like, Oh, tell Eric your wild fit story. Now they see, I, he's 12 or something like he, he has a wild fit story. And, and there, he starts telling, he's like the year before he had really struggled and tried really hard to get on the track team. He just couldn't get there this year, post wild fit. He was like the star of the track team. It was, it was really fascinating. So what was interesting is I then, I then, I, I went to uh, Amber and I go, how did you get your kids to do this? Cause I really want to get this message out to kids, like in a big way. If you, the earlier you can interrupt these behaviors, the, the easier the whole job is, right? I want to get to the kids. She's, she laughs and she looks at river and goes, river, why don't you tell him how I got to you? And, and River, her 16-year-old, says, I was the one who got her to do it. No kidding. No kidding. He had come to a talk of mine in Vancouver, Canada. He had seen me speak about it. And he went home to his mom and said, we got to make some changes. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, kids can get in on this stuff if they're, if they're doing it through attraction. It's tough if they're doing it through force. Now, yeah. let's talk a little bit about Crohn's disease. I'm, I'm sorry that she's going through that. It, is, it can be very, very difficult. I will tell you anecdotally that we've had really, really good success with Crohn's and other digestive disorders, really, really good results. So I, I can't make any promises of cures or offer any kind of medical advice here. I'm just saying that there are some things that we do in this program that really seem to work well relative to um, uh, improving digestive capacity for people with Crohn's and IBS and other things like that. So I have serious hope for her and I definitely want to hear her story if she decides to join you on the journey. Fantastic. Now. Your other child, did you say six? Uh, nine. Nine, nine. So nine, you're at a, you're at a bit of a tough, um, you know, like it's, there are these stages with kids. You, you can have a big influence on kids when they're three and four and five and six years old. But after five, as they get to five and six, seven, eight, nine, you're now not the strongest influence anymore. The kids around them start to become it and the teachers and the parties that they have to go to and so on. So one of the things that I would suggest is this, is that, um, you don't do anything with a nine-year-old that's based on restriction at all. Like you just don't. In fact, what I do with my little six-year-old is when she comes home and they, they, you know, she goes to school and she comes back with M&Ms. I'm like, I, I just don't even, she comes back with M&Ms and then she asks me, can I eat these? And I, I just, I want to say no. I want to say no, but I know what that leads to. What that leads to is rebellion. And by the way, we all think rebellion starts, you know, in the teen years. No, it starts at four. I think that's rebellion begin. It's part of their growing up. It's part of their developing independence. And so, you know, if you say no, you're giving them something to rebel against. So what I did with my little girl is I started talking to her about what M&Ms do. And you, you can have them, but I just want to warn you that, you know, sometimes when you have a bit of a sugar crush and then you can have a little bit of a tantrum or something like that, like, Often that's because you've had that stuff. So you can have it. I just want you to know the consequence. And then, and then we talk a little bit about why sugar is in everything. So she now understands that sugar is in everything in order to make her hungry so that they can make more profit. She gets that. She, she knows it. So she now comes home with the M&Ms and she goes, daddy, can I eat these M&Ms? And you, I go, so you know that you can. And you know, like, it's up to you. I, I wouldn't, but it's up to you. And then no kidding. She walks over, pulls out the rubbish bin and drops them in. Or sometimes I buy, like, I don't know if you guys know that uh, Keep Candy Kick Sugar brand. They, you know, there's some sort of like semi-responsible versions of candy. And so what I've done with her is I'll, I'll buy the junk food from her with healthier versions. So th that's how I would deal with younger kids. If you try to, a 16-year-old can understand the prison camp. They can understand a little restriction for a few weeks to make a change. Nine-year-olds, it doesn't work that way so much. So rather what you have to do is work from a position of permission. So if you get your family to go through this with you, then I think circumstantially, the nine-year-old would end up just coming along with the journey because of what you're cooking and what you're making and what you're observing. And for your daughter, I think this could be absolutely life-changing. I totally hope she does it. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We're back. We're at time, right? 
Guys, this has been so much fun. Thank you for all the great questions. For those of you who had questions that I didn't get to, I, I'm, I'm sorry. We, there is a Facebook group, right? Yes. So um, the way the Facebook group works, for those of you who are on, if, if you're not on Facebook, I do not encourage you to join Facebook to join the group. I, I, if you're off Facebook at this point, probably stay away. But if you're already on Facebook and you want to go to the group, then the way we do this is every week you'll see a post that's like questions for week one, questions for week two. Please put your questions there. If, of course, you're here with a coach, probably direct your questions to your own coach. That's the best place to get the best answer. But if you are putting questions in the main Facebook group, put them in that thread so that we have a chance to be able to get to those ones. Conversations that take place elsewhere in the group, we don't pay attention to those, even if you tag us. If you put them in the right thread, there's a good chance you'll get an answer. And then, of course, we have another call coming up on Wednesday, and uh, I will do my best to get to as many more. Qu Wednesday will be a lot more Q&A. Today, I had a bunch of introductory stuff to do for you. So for now... For now, as you go into this week, you're going you're gonna to learn some really powerful stuff about the food angel and the food devil and your own internal dialogue. Um, on Wednesday, when we talk, I'm going to ask how many of you have recently discovered that you might have a multiple personality disorder relative to food because you talk to yourself a lot about it and you're going to become even more aware of that. You're also going to learn about the food timeline, really paying attention to the way uh, your decision processes work with food, how food really tastes and how it makes you feel. What I want you to notice about this is that it's not just about the videos you're watching, but it's about listening to those videos and then bringing that consciousness to your eating experiences every day. And you are, I'm telling you right now, going to experience measurable changes in your psychology about food, even this week. Welcome to WildFit. It really works. I'm glad you're here. Recording stopped.